So we are halfway through the year and a lot of booktubers are making videos about the best things that they have read so far this year. And there's also many other tags such as the Meteor Book Freakout tag, which is a tag that I've done, I always do it. But there's many other uh, lists and book tags and prompts and things about similar topics. So do we really need a video about the best books so far in the year? I think we do. I think we do because uh, for the people making the video, it's incredibly fun. But also for the people watching the video, it can be really helpful to have uh, a very clear list of hopefully good recommendations. So that's what I'm doing today. I'm giving you the best books that I think I've read this year. And uh, hopefully you will pick these books up uh, because they are quite incredible. Now, let me give you a little bit of context about my reading year, my reading 2020. I have read around 27 books so far this year, which is a pretty good amount for me. Um, it, it 2020 has actually turned out to be a surprisingly good year for my reading, you know, because of the pandemic and the free time and, you know, ev how everything has slowed down. Um, it really has given me more time than ever before. So I've been reading a lot more and the quality of the books that I've chosen to read this year has also been, for the most part, really incredible. So I have chosen only five books to show you today because I feel like, you know, from 27 books in the year, five is like a pretty good selection, you know, the cream of the crop. So um, it was very hard making this list. I really have read some amazing things this year, some things that were almost in this list, but but I didn't make the cut, like uh, Hilary Mantel's trilogy, uh, Wolf Hall, uh, Bringing Up the Bodies, and The Mirror and the Light. The more I think about my experience with those books, I'm not sure I enjoyed it as much as I appreciated it. So yeah, I have my my qualms with Hilary Mantel, but there are many other books that I was very, very uh, close to including here, like um, a Daphne du Maurier book that I show that I read, uh, The Parasites, um, The North Water by Ian McGuire, Peachy Woodhouse, which, you know, he's, uh, his books are always amazing. And I felt sort of guilty not including him in this list. But anyway, the five books that I have chosen. Oh, and I actually chose a, um, an honorable mention because, okay, so my honorable mention is Tipping the Velvet by Sarah Waters. This was the first book that I finished in 2020. I actually read most of it back in December 2019 when I was visiting Buenos Aires in Argentina. And this book was just so cozy and strange and it didn't go exactly where I was thinking it would go. It was surprising, it was atmospheric and the writing was beautiful. It's not my favorite thing that I have read by Sarah Waters, but but it was it was a very interesting rewarding experience. So I wanted to include it, not in my top five, but as an honorable mention. And now the top five, I don't really have them in order, except for the final two, because I mean, those are um, by far the best two books that I have read in the year. But the other three are sort of interchangeable, I guess. Um, so firstly, we have Ohio by Stephen Markley. This is a literary fiction novel. It is wonderful because it's it's one of those books that you can read um, just for the story and for the characters without thinking too much about it. But if you want to think much more about it, there's enough depth. I think there's a lot of depth in here and there's many layers. It's like an onion. It's layer up a layer up a layer. Oh, there's a scary pigeon, right? They're just looking at me like locking eyes with me <laughs> okay <laughs> move move along move along Ooh. anyway so ohio is a remarkable novel it was his debut novel it is incredibly 
fast-paced and suspenseful and mysterious and intriguing. There are many characters, many different plot lines. There's flashbacks, there's interweaving stories that intersect and interconnect in weird, gruesome ways. It's also a social critique about America, but really about all of us. Um, it, it, the things that this book addresses thematically certainly apply to my own country, my own city in Mexico. Um, so yeah, this was almost a five-star read. It was just remarkable. Then we have Q's Legacy by Helene Hamp. This is a nonfiction book about books and about writing and about reading and about the joy of the written word, I guess. And it's also a biographical text because it's uh, Helene Hamp uh, retelling many anecdotes and stories from her life, how she came to write the very popular book, 84 Charing Cross Road, and all of the sequels and related books and adaptations to the stage and to film. And it's just such a a, a warm, cozy, nostalgic, really delightful, charming uh, piece of nonfiction. So yeah, this was incredible. Um, and then very similar, sort of in the same vein as that book, we have The Diary of a Bookseller by Sean Biddle, another nonfiction book about books, but it's sort of coming from a different angle, from a different avenue. This one is more about um, you know, it's the diary of Sean Biddle, so we get to see his thoughts and all the goings-on in his life for an entire year. He owns the bookshop in Wigtown, Scotland, which is a very important, popular, and wonderful bookshop that I would love to go someday. And we sort of uh, read about his rambling thoughts and it's delightful it's incredibly funny it's it's a hilarious book with a very sort of dry but warm at the same time kind of humor i just loved it and there's many interesting things here about the book selling business the state of bookshops and uh customers and you know um book shopping etiquette as well so yeah it's delightful as well and then we come to the final two books, which are, as I said, the absolute cream of the crop. And I think both of these books are uh, in conversation with one another. Um, one of them is a more classical one, and it has definitely influenced the other one, which is a modern one, a contemporary novel, very recently published. So I really like that both of them are in conversation with one another. They are almost reflecting or mirroring one another, but in different ways, thematically, they are uh, kind of in conversation, but... um. Sorry, I just got a little paranoid because of the pigeon and I heard some noises and I'm wearing my AirPods, so it's weird. Anyway, um, so both of the books are remarkable and sort of related in mysterious, wonderful ways. The classical one is Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Wall, which is a perfect novel. It is probably my favorite modern classic. I don't know, I would have to think about it. But yeah, I just adored this book. And then the more contemporary one is French Exit by Patrick DeWitt. I'm so lucky that I have these um, signed copy, signed by the author. Oh, it's very shiny, there it is. So both of these books are sort of similar in certain regards, but they, you know, you can read them separately. You don't have to necessarily read both of them, although I would recommend that you do because they are both amazing. So Brides Have Revisited by Evelyn Waugh is a perfect novel, I think, about um, these sort of um, very prestigious aristocratic family in England. We follow them, all the characters in that family. We see the story through another character who is more innocent, naive, or question. It's he's like a translucent character th whose eyes really serve the purpose of of allowing us to see these other people who are 
these aristocrats and um, people from uh, Oxford University. And it's, it's a book that has everything. Um, it's a book that is very funny. The writing is absolutely pristine and elegant and wonderful, but it's also very warm and, and very accessible. So it's a very readable book. Um, thematically, it's super rich. It deals with religion, with class, with family, with innocence, with um, corruption. It deals with so many different things and um, it's a very enjoyable read. It's funny, it's dialogue driven, it's character driven. It's also about war and the decline of this uh, sort of British aristocratic um, empire, em empire kind of, you know, nobility. And um, it's a perfect book. It's, the humor is really wonderful. And then we have Patrick DeWitt's French Exit, which is about this um, socialites, this ridiculously wealthy and just ridiculous people who live in New York in... Um, the Upper East Side, so they are completely corrupted with money. Like they, they are, they are drowning in their own wealth until something happens and they are completely broke. And so they have to leave their home, they have to leave their life, and they have to go to France, uh, <laughs> and they have to think about how they can solve their financial problems and you know that just opens a big can of worms of existential problems and identity problems it's hilarious it's the funniest book that i've read in in years it's absolutely hysterical this is the funniest book i have read in five years i think it's just wonderful it's also very poignant even though it is a very light-hearted very slight slim book it packs a punch there's many layers here it's exactly my kind of book it's short it's bittersweet it's cinematic but it's also something that could only exist in literary format so i absolutely adored it it's it's a it's an instant five star for me and that is french exit and i would recommend that you read if you read one read the other or read both of them um, that's that's a great way to to um, have a, a conversation between two two works of literature. So that's it. That's my unnecessary video about my favorite books of the year so far. These are really amazing. I would recommend all of them for the for a myriad different reasons. Thanks for watching. I am Just One Reader. I will see you in the next video. And please let me know in the comment section down below some of your recommendations so that I can, you know, keep having a wonderful 2020.